Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BH Virtual Event Space. You're tuned into another edition of 10 Images, 10 Stories. This episode, we will talk with a staple here on the event space, Tony Gale. Tony, this is a new space for us here. It you is. Just lay back. I, yeah, if I fall asleep, just, you know, sound the <laughs> siren or something. We'll just run the images on a loop until you wake up again. There, there you go. Well, it's great to have you on. You know, it, it's good because you're on here so much educating. I'm like, it's time that we get inside your brain a little bit and get to see some images that you like and that you want to talk about. Hear some stories behind them. Hear what was going through your mind when when you took these images and really just get behind Tony Gale, the photographer. So I want to thank you for for being a part of this series. And I want to start it with every once in a while, we as photographers have to or maybe not have to, but we we evaluate where we are as photographers. I know I do all the time. What kind of photographer am I? What kind of images do I like to take? What kind of photographer do you see yourself as? Uh, well, that's a difficult question. I mean, when people say, what kind of photography do you do? I say people and portraits for editorial, corporate, and advertising clients. I mean, that's that's the sort of elevator pitch. Um, but, you know, I shoot landscapes for fun. There's a couple landscapes in here. As I've talked about in some of the presentations I've done, I think when we're starting out, we all want to shoot everything. And that there's no reason that you can't continue to shoot everything. You just have to only, I shouldn't say you have to. You may want to show a more specific thing and hone in on something specific so you get better at it. But for fun, there's no reason you can't still shoot whatever it is that you like balloon racing or fly fishing or definitely scuba diving. Is there anything you find yourself that you struggle with? I know we as professional photographers, it's always easy to say, well, we know how to take a good photo across the board. And then every once in a while I'll go into the desert on a trip at night and get zero usable images? Um, I'm a pretty mediocre bird photographer, uh, but I think it's lately I've been thinking it's fun. That's why something like the Alpha 9.3 with the pre-capture uh, makes me a less mediocre bird photographer. Uh, I, I think most things I can do passably, uh, but yeah, of course you're not, even a, an experienced photographer like you or I, we should be able to do most things competently, but not necessarily get the most amazing thing just because there's so many different things you can do. There's so many different types of photography. There's so many different nuances and you, some of it, you just need that experience and that knowledge. Definitely. Definitely. Well, look, we laid the groundwork. We're going to get to the easy part. We're going to pull some images here. And oh, I started all the way back at the end. So, look, we'll start it here, Tony. Is this the end or is this the second from the end? Ah, there we go. Is that a good starting spot? Sure. We'll, we'll go in reverse chronological. There order. we go. We're going to go in reverse chronological. Um, I will say picking 10 pictures is hard. Uh. You know, I had picked like a hundred maybe to pick from and I kept narrowing it down, narrowing it down. And then I shot, I photographed this, not this past weekend, the weekend before and added it instead of something else. This is my daughter. Um, and I just wanted to play around photographing her with the Alpha 9 III with, because it's got the global shutter. So it can do uh, flash sync speed at any, at any shutter speed. So this is a 3200th of a second with a Sony speed light and an umbrella. Wow. Uh, overpowering the sun. I mean, you can see the sun back there. You can see that the sun's coming from behind because of the shadow of that tree. Um, but I, I think it balances really well. Uh, and, you know, that camera is magic. And then I just, I love her expression and her determination. This is a, you know, like a car that can hold up to 600 pounds that I use for, we have a, a place in Connecticut and I use like a when a tree falls down and I have to cut it up or whatever. And she pulls this thing that's three times her size up and down the driveway 
And if you try and help, she's like, no, no, I got it. I got it. She she's does. giving you the look like back off. Yeah. Got it. Well, she'll say no. She she can't say I got it yet. She's only 21 months. But um, and just that that determination and that that expression, I just I just loved. Um, I got to so. ask you the, the parent question, parent photographer question, more images with the mobile phone or with the camera? So uh, more with the with the phone because it's always with me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to be better at having a camera readily accessible. But I also, because I'm running around after her, I I have to be sure that, <laughs> that I don't have a camera in one hand when I need both hands to be like, no, no, we're stopping here. This is the road now. We are not going out in the road. Uh, you know, this I went out with the plan, obviously with the light. Uh, but it is more often with, with the phone. But I have the Xperia Pro I. So it's a one inch sensor camera on the phone. And it can shoot raw. It can do, you know, a high frame rate. And I use that all the time. So it's like a middle ground. You get a nice middle ground between yeah. professional camera and phone as you as you learn how quick toddlers are and how unpredictable. Well, and how often you they do something amazing. So you get set up and you're ready. You're like, Just do that again. Do that again. And then finally you <laughs> give up and you put it down and then they do it. I always wonder if it's better to have more images because, you know, we grew up in a generation where it was like, some people had no pictures of themselves. Some people, you know, were blessed to have pictures, a little bit of video. But, you know, as you get older, it's like, man, I wish I had more more images of me as a child. But now I'm like, I'm going to have to ask my son when he grows up, is it, do you wish, does he wish he had way less photos and videos of him or I wonder how it is? Well, we'll see when she's old enough to express more of an opinion. Like if she says, don't take my picture, I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, I don't, I have almost no pictures from my childhood. You know, there's just a handful. Uh, and I think there's value to that, having that history. I mean, I think your kid, when you're, when they get older, will love having that, even if they don't when they're a teenager, when they're 40 or 50 or 60, they're going to love having that history. There, uh -huh. there may be a time in between where they're like, oh, man, I took too many pictures. It's so annoying. Uh, but there will be a time when they're happy that they're there. Yeah, I think it's like teenage years to like mid-20s where you're like, delete, delete, delete all these old images. And then you, you get, become an adult and you're like, man, I even appreciate the ugly images. Yeah, it's still a piece of time. It's still a moment. Definitely. I mean, that's one of the things about photography. You know, moments don't really exist because time just keeps moving right there is no now because now implies that time stopped for that now and there is no it just keeps going right even the time it takes to say now is you know however a quarter of a second or something but a photo does stop time you do capture a moment in a way that just isn't possible in any other way poetic wow All right, this is uh, Taylor Rooks. She's a sports journalist. Uh, this was for a magazine called New York Moves uh, last year. Uh, I put this in in part because I just really like the the orange outfit and the sort of foggy, misty background. Um, but also because it's an example of the the editor of the magazine is on set and Often, you know, when, when the client is there and it's something like editorial where there isn't a specific vision, you know, if it's advertising or something, there's usually a layout and you're trying to create something very, very specific. With editorial, often it's pretty loose. And a lot of times people will suggest things that I'm like, ah, yeah, I don't think that's a great idea. We can do it if you really want, but I, um, and the editor had suggested we go outside and I thought this is going to the weather's terrible. It's not going to work at all. And then it was great that the orange popping against, you know, the sort of desaturated background because of the weather. I really liked 
I actually went up to her afterwards. I'm like, this was a great idea. I didn't think it was going to work, but it, it looks great. Um, and this was the Alpha 7 R5 and the 2470 GM2. Yeah, the whole the whole color scale works. I mean, the greens, yeah. the oranges all around. There's like little pops of greens and turquoise kind of. And yeah, it all but, works well together. But no strong. I mean, there's the cones, mm -hmm. I guess, which sort of echo her outfit. But most of the colors are so subtle. Yeah. That it really pops. It's muted. And she just the way that orange and there's something about the fabric. It's like that satiny look to the fabric and the contrast on there that just really. And you can Pops. see it, you can see the movement. You know, it's you can yeah. tell she's not just standing that way. The fabric is moving. Uh and yeah. even like the guy with the shopping bag over there on the corner, you know, stepping off the corner. It just gives like the real touch. Did you have any I, I want to bring it up because you, you do see the mask there? And it was interesting. I had done a, a commercial job. It was back in either late 2020 or early 2021. And it was funny because it was like they it had to be timeless. And they wanted they wanted street shots, and it had to be there like no masks. We don't want it to look like this is from a certain era. Um, have you received any direction like that in the past couple of years? No, but only because I don't shoot street photography. Like most of what I'm doing is controlled enough that mm -hmm. if you don't want something, you just don't have it. It's not there. Um, but to quibble with your thing. The masks aren't the only thing that give it, make it a snapshot in time. You know, wardrobe, hair, haircuts, the cars, whatever, you know, whatever's parked on the street. There's a lot of clues to the era. So it's not, no street photography is going to be timeless in the sense of you have no idea when it was photographed. Yeah, definitely. I, just, I love also her, the expression. I mean, we talk about gesture all the time in, in photography, just the hands, the, the movement but she still has like this stoic look about her. What, yes. what was the, what was the shoot? Like, is there any direction? How much do you direct and how much do you just react? It depends on the person I'm photographing. Um, I try and direct as little as possible. Again, yeah. unless, unless there's a very specific layout, you know, if, mm -hmm. if the brief is we, we need somebody looking up and to the left with their hands like this, you know, whatever, you have to direct to that. Um, but most of the way I photograph people is I'm interested in seeing who they are. And as I tell people, most of them I just met that day, right? They come up, you know, she went through hair and makeup. She comes out. I meet her. Um, I don't know anything about her. She's a sports journalist. I've since been in like airports and seen her on TVs in the background and stuff. But um you know, I wasn't familiar with her. I can't direct her to be her because I don't know who, who that is. Uh, so I, I'll just talk to people. We'll just have conversations and I'll give people as much, uh, just as much flexibility as possible. So that if, if there's somebody who's smiling and happy, we'll get a smiling and happy picture. Um, usually... Almost everybody I photograph for any length of time, I have pictures of them laughing. You just in their conversations, that usually happens. I did photograph somebody once who smiled and he's like, no, I don't want to smile in this picture because he'd written something that was really sad. And it was about what he'd written. He's like, okay. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, we just talk, you know, where'd you grow up? Uh, you know, Where's the last place you went on vacation? Depending on how much time we have, we might get into hobbies or who knows what. Mm -hmm. Ice breaking, keeping keeping yeah. a nice casual casual tone. And then you just shoot through. You just keep taking pictures and edit down later. How often do you have commercial jobs where people will point out something that they're not comfortable with or something that like, hey, I photograph better from here or I like to be photographed like this? Do you get it very often or no? Uh, I would say 20% of people I photograph feel that way. Okay. Um, it's mostly real people. Like I do a lot of corporate stuff and there oh. will be people on corporate shoots who are like, oh no, this is my good side. Um, or, you know, I, no, I, I can't smile or I can't smile with teeth or whatever. Um, 
And what I typically tell people in those situations is, uh, look, we're going to shoot a bunch of different things. Um, if it's a corporate shoot, they usually have a say in, in the choice. Uh, and I'm like, you know, you're going to be able to veto things. So why don't we try a bunch of things? Maybe, maybe that is your good side. Maybe that smiling without teeth is going to be the answer. Um, but we don't want 200 pictures that are all the same. So we'll, we'll do a bunch of different stuff and you don't have to pick the ones you don't like. Makes sense. I have a little, a little variety, some options. Yeah. And people often have an idea of what the right answer is and it may be an okay answer. Um, you know, maybe looking like this with your chin here and no smile and just a hint of a smile looks good most of the time, but the likelihood that it is the best possible picture we can get is low. It might be. And I would like to get the best possible picture. So I would rather shoot a range of things and maybe we get a better picture than be limited by that. I also think most people that think they have a good side, I I don't actually believe that most people truly have a good side. Some people do. Um, but if you say that this is your good side, so you want to face this direction and the light is here, then it's broad lighting. And depending on who you are, it, it may not be flatter. Great point. You know, the light <laughs> controls more than, I'm sorry, you were saying. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, just the light has more of an impact on what is the good side in the moment than anything else, I think. Definitely. I mean, a lot of people haven't been photographed by a professional, someone who knows all the little nuances, the lighting, the angles, and all that. I mean, how many people are so... I'm sure you, you come across it all the time, people who they're so comfortable in taking selfies now where people, they know one angle, they know they want to see themselves in the screen and... It's almost a trust thing to hand the reins over to somebody else and take an image of them. Yeah, some people are terrified. I, I photographed somebody who was almost shaking on a corporate shoot. She was so nervous. Wow. Because um, it's, it's scarier than it needs to be. You know, people are much harder on themselves than they should be. Definitely. Yeah, there can be, there's a good picture of everybody out there. We just have to find it. I'm still looking for mine. I don't think I photographed you. Maybe that's the problem. No, there we go. We got to make it happen one day. All right. This is an actor in LA. Um, the Alpha One and the Fifty One Two. I have a little. Um, it's actually the light that's on me right now. Uh, light and motion CLX. Well, this is CLX Ten. That was a CLX Eight with a little. Uh, like 18 inch soft box on the, on the side. Um, this was, I was in LA for uh, an APA board meeting. APA is American photographic artists. I used to be the national president of APA until I term limited out. Um, so I was there for a board meeting. And when I do things like that, I like to shoot just because, you know, the people you photograph in LA are different. Uh, I found this location on peer space so I rented this, uh, it's like this crazy garage. The person I rented from lives in it. And it, like, it's not a garage. Like you're thinking like, it's not a two car garage. It's like a 50 car garage or something, you know? <laughs> um, but it had a roll up door at the end and he just had so much cool stuff in it. Uh, so I found this guy on backstage, um, we just looked around for different things. I just, location photography is my favorite with people, more so than studio, just because you can put people in such interesting places. Uh, like, no, never in a million years would you bring in a, somebody to do set dressing and build this set. It just wouldn't. Oh, no. Uh -uh. It would never happen. And it's just so cool with the jacket and the flag and all the magazines. And, you know, I don't, I I don't know what that gun is on the right. I, I'm guessing a BB gun because it's LA, but I don't know. I'm not touching it. Um, <laughs> you know, the motorcycle in the foreground. And then I shot at one, two, so that I could use the ambient light in addition to my light. So you can see on the shadow side, 
all that neon, the shadow is very red because the neon's filling it because it's because uh, the uh, exposure is, is so low. Um, I just I just think it looks cool. It's it, this actually feels kind of timeless to me. I said things didn't feel timeless, yeah. but you look at this. I mean, it could be any of a number of eras. I yeah. think. I like- I like that warm, the warm glow. How often do you shoot wide open? Is that a normal thing for you, or I I wouldn't say it's normal or abnormal. Um, when the moment calls for it, yeah. If there's a reason, mm-hmm. you know, shooting at one two it can be dangerous. That's where I autofocus really, really saves the day. Um, before I was shooting mirrorless with I autofocus, shooting at one two. Who knows what would that's, have been focus? It's a crap shoot. The likelihood it would have been his eyes is pretty low. Um, and maybe you wouldn't have been able to tell, maybe you would have, but you know, the stuff, the, the modern stuff is just absolutely amazing. And I think something like this, I think it needs to be shallow. Like the motorcycle is just a little out of focus in the foreground. It's not crazy out of focus because with a 50, it's just not going to be. But uh, I didn't also don't want it so out of focus that you don't know what it is but by being just a little soft i think it doesn't draw too much attention you know it just it all goes to him yeah it's the perfect balance of focal length and and the shallow depth of field like you said if this were shot longer and you throw that bike out of focus more it just doesn't at that point it's a distraction it, you need to have the bike there but at the same time you can't have this shot at f8 and have too much detail drawing attention away from him. It's like the perfect balance. Well, I don't know if it's perfect because everything could be better, but it's it's in the right <laughs> it's in the right ballpark. It's in the realm. All right. This is um Old Faithful in Yellowstone. Uh with the comet Neo Wise back there. So this was wow. summer of 2020 when there was that lull in COVID. Uh we do a national parks trip every year. And uh a lot of the places to stay in the park were closed so it wasn't that crowded um and we were staying in a cabin by old faithful by the old faithful lodge so i had this idea that i wanted to photograph old faithful erupting at night in part because i had never seen that picture i'm not saying it doesn't exist i'm sure there were other people photographing when i did um and i'm sure that 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 it has been photographed many times at night, but I hadn't seen it. And, you know, one of the things with iconic things like Old Faithful is you've seen it so much, you don't necessarily want to do the exact same thing everybody else has done. Sometimes you do. Like when I went to Machu Picchu, there's an overlook that everybody photographs from because it's awesome. And I photograph from it because it's super cool, um, but it's not that different than anything a thousand other people have done or a hundred thousand. But this, so Old Faithful at night, that was the plan. I'd forgotten that the comet was in the sky because living in New York City, sure, there's a comet. We're never going to see it. (laughs) Like you see like four stars. Um, So we walked out and I'm like, oh, the comet. So I set up so that the comet would be, you know, just off to the side so I could get them both. Um, and, you know, just just shot through. This is uh, Alpha 7 R4 with the 24 R14 GM. And, you know, there's a little boardwalk just set up there. And, you know, you get like eight shots because it only erupts for a certain amount of time. It was a 13 second exposure. Um, and it was just awesome. And then, so I was thrilled. I was very, very happy with it. And, you know, I enter photo contests all the time because it's good to say you're an award-winning photographer. Gets you, it, but at least potentially, it gets you more publicity and more awareness. And there's a photo contest in the UK by the Association of Photographers that years ago when I was assisting, somebody told me, was like, oh, that's the contest. So this won the nature category in that. Um, awesome and you know some other little things but it was just it was just so cool and then 
with the comet, you know, there was what two, three weeks where it was even possible to get a shot like this. And you know, obviously the comet would have been in a slightly position, different position each time. Mm -hmm. Um, so while there, I'm like I said, even though I hadn't seen, I'm sure that there are other pictures of yellow or of uh, Old Faithful at night. There is definitely not very many pictures of Old Faithful at night with the comet in the background. That's awesome. Uh, so this is for a magazine again. There's um, it's a magazine I, I shoot for occasionally called New York Moves. Every fall they do a Power Women issue. And I've photographed, I think I've photographed like seven of the last nine years or eight of the last 10 or something. Um, but in 19, no, not 1999, I was still in Seattle. I was assistant. In <laughs> 2019, um, I had suggested that we do a sort of composite, you know, like Vanity Fair does. So we had where we were set up, you know, we shoot over four days or five days. Um, you know, we had a set set up where everybody would come in as part of the shoot and we'd shoot that. So this is, I don't know, 12 different pictures or 14 different pictures or something. Um, you know, the light doesn't change for the one that they actually use. So this is only photos I took. There's also a version of it that the magazine used that had, there was somebody shooting in London. There was somebody shooting in LA somebody shooting in Florida. Uh, so there's a version that has their pictures in it too. So, so to do that, I'm like, the camera is this high off the ground. You need this focal length. You need this F-stop. Uh, you need to light from this side with a really big light source, seven foot umbrella or a bounce, uh, and then blending all of those together. But for things like this, if you plan it, if you think about it ahead of time, I think it, it can look really seamless. No, it does. But composites give me anxiety. I think there's just, for me, I, I don't know what it is. It's it's like, I, I guess I just don't trust myself. There's so much that can go wrong, I think. But it looks beautiful when it's done right. But no, no anxiety on your end. Is there anything that you, or anything that you make have to make sure that you knock out at the time of shooting? Well, it's just the consistency more than anything. Um, th this was difficult. Some of the other photographers didn't really follow my specs. So trying to fix the things that they had done incorrectly and retouching were, were tough. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's on black, because it's on black seamless, it's a lot easier. Uh, I've done it where it's on a location and there, there it's much harder because here if the camera moved a little it was fine you know if the tripod moved mm -hmm. but if you're doing it on location you know let's say we do a composite of uh, all the bnh event space staff the bnh office but you can only be there on thursday and since stephanie can be there on wednesday and danny's there on tuesday you know it's really challenging if everything isn't locked down so if i have to move that camera every day um then that's where it gets hard. Yeah, the slightest bit angle off. Yeah. Or, yeah. I mean, it, and it's fixable. Like I did the retouching on this. If it was a situation where I had less control, mm -hmm. I would want to bring in somebody who's better at retouching than I am. Uh, this You're is making me want to be back out there, Tony. I say go for it. <laughs> go out there. I love uh, it out there. This is the North Kaibab Trail in the Grand Canyon. Um, in 2019, uh, I had been planning, I did a through hike, a rim to rim hike. So you go, I did North Rim to South Rim. You go to the South Rim, you park, you take a shuttle that goes once a day to the North Rim, stay the night. There's only one place to stay that's on the rim on the North Rim. So there's a lot of logistics because um, you have to make sure you've got a space to stay. So stay at the North Rim at the North Rim Lodge. At four in the morning, you take the shuttle from the lodge to the trailhead uh, and you start walking. Um, 
it's 14 miles down, not down, but it's a 14 mile hike. It's about a mile down uh, to Phantom Ranch. So I stayed at Phantom Ranch for two nights, which is uh, cabins at the bottom of the Grand Canyon that are, they used to have dorms and private cabins. So I got into a dorm because it's so hard to get a reservation. Now the dorms have been closed since COVID. I don't know if they're reopening. Um, but it's just such a cool experience, especially the North Rim is hardly visited. So most of that 14 miles to Phantom Ranch, uh, which took, I think took me about seven hours to walk 14 miles. Um, I didn't see anybody. Wow. Like maybe I saw six people on the entire, on that entire walk from the North Rim. So you've got, you're in one of the most incredible uh, natural places on the planet by yourself. And it, it's just awe-inspiring. There was a rattlesnake. That was not, that was. That was not awe-inspiring. No, although it was interesting because, you know, you're sort of zoning out, you're walking. Mm -hmm. And then I heard the rattle because it was just right there on the trail. Oh, done man. in itself and it's such a visceral thing like there's so, something so primal you hear that rattle and you're like slowly back up out. um and then i waited about 20 minutes and he wasn't moving so i ended up having to walk fortunately it wasn't somewhere like this that was very very steep uh, but i had to you know walk around him off the trail in the back oh, man. i was gonna but, say i don't i I came from the South Rim. I don't, I don't remember seeing anything. This looks pretty, pretty yeah, scary no, there. It, it's a, uh, it, a little bit, especially cause you're starting in the dark. You know, you've got a headlamp, but when you start mm. at the top, you it's dark and you're starting in the dark because I was doing it in August just cause that was the only time I could get space and it gets really hot in August at yeah. the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So you're trying to get, uh, there's a place called the box, which is the last few miles before you get to Phantom Ranch. And you're just in, you know, narrow canyons. And the, if the sun is going straight down, it just gets really, really, really hot. So you're trying to get through that before the worst heat of the day. Uh, so yeah, it does get brutal, but it's, I, you should do it. I got to do it one day. I, I've only been once. It was an impromptu hike down, made it about halfway down South Rim, halfway down to the bottom and time. If you don't, if you don't plan, it's not the place you want to go and not be prepared. No, it's a long way down. Yeah. Like it, to do that in a day is, is not an easy thing to go all the way down and back up. I mean, I, I did 14 miles in, stayed two nights at Phantom Ranch and then I think it was, it's about nine miles. There's the South Cape Kaibab Trail and another trail. I forget the name of it. Um, one of them has water and one doesn't. So I hiked the one that has water so I didn't have to carry as much. Uh, but it took me almost as long to hike out as to go in, even though it was shorter. Just because it's, you know, it's steep. Oh, yeah. And it wears on you, especially once you, once you have to start making your ascent. Just those switchbacks up and up and up and up and up and up. Ah, uh, I know. But it's incredible. I encourage everyone who has any interest. You have to do it at least once. Yep. I just had a a carabiner so that my camera strap would stay on my backpack strap because I didn't want to have to keep getting it in and out. And I didn't want to have to carry oh, it. Oh so. yeah. What what camera did you bring when you hiked the? Uh, that was the A seven R three, the Alpha seven R three, with the twelve twenty four G. I brought a tripod right. too, but I ended up really not Oof. using it. Um, it's a Gitzo Traveler. It's not very heavy. Okay. Uh, but you know, if you're gonna do that hike, you you got to bring a camera. Yeah. You, you can't just be your phone. No, no. There's no phone out there that I would feel comfortable enough. I think when I did it, I had. I had multiple lenses and I, you half regret it when you get back, but then it's like you get back and it's like, you want the full breadth of what's out there. Cause there's so much, as far as you can see, there's, there's photos. Yeah. It's incredible. Everywhere you look. Yeah. 
Uh, this is a poet named Terrence Hayes. This was for Poets and Writers magazine. Um, we photographed him first at his apartment. He had, I think he teaches at NYU, so he had on-campus housing. So we did a cover shoot, you know, with a seamless in his apartment. Uh, and then this, somebody has told me that this place is closed since. I don't know if that's true, but this was his favorite little restaurant cafe. Uh, so we walked over there and it's just sort of with the actor from LA, a cool location is just such a great place to photograph somebody in. And especially in this instance, because it was somewhere that he loved, uh, that just adds another layer to it. Uh, so I just really, I just really thought it was cool. It's, you know, there's a big, uh, there's a big octobank on the left and a little bit of fill on the right. This was with the Alpha 7 R3 and a 2470 GM. Um, but it's just, there's just so much going on. You know, the, the menu on the, on the wall and the tables and the chairs and, you know, even the condiments and then i like his pensive look his thoughtful like you know i've i've got a lot on my mind even that cup of orange juice it provides yeah. a pop especially where it is just you know he's he's got like the the muted you know grayish blue on and that pop of color right there it just draws your eye in well you gotta wear dark colors if you're a poet in new york Oh, is that the that's the standard issue uniform? Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, anything in the arts in New York, you got to wear dark dark colors, right? You've got your black sweatshirt on. It's you know, yeah, you're right. This is this is my uniform. Yeah, I blend into my. I'm I'm like a a floating head on here every day. But I, we added the orange juice because I think it's weird when somebody's sitting at a table that's clearly a dining table of some kind and there's nothing there. Interesting. So that was an intentional, yeah, intentional decision. I like that. Yeah, I mean, why would and he the just be sitting there? Super hungry. Well, maybe you can find out if it did. I'd close. be there with the chili burger. Yeah. See the now, question. Yeah, now we got to find out. Is it like a New Mexico chili burger where it's a sliced chili, or is it a chili burger with chili the, the dish? Oh yeah, no, yeah, it's got to be. I don't, I don't, not right now. I don't think I could do the New Mexico style right now. But I'll take a bacon cheeseburger. Those, those always, I think that's the safest travel food. There's one thing I've learned that if, whether in a good food place or a bad food place, a burger is always does it justice. I don't, I don't know. I've had burgers that tasted like sawdust, you know, where it's <laughs> such a disappointing thing. So let me know where to stay away from then. <laughs> it's, it's been, there, there's been one, one thing that's kind of saved me is, is the burgers. But yeah, when you, when you get that bad burger, it's like, kind of lose your faith in humanity it's like the most simple form of sustenance well it's all have you had a burger in europe no i've never been to europe well you should go to europe go to the grand you know hike rim to rim and then go to europe but i think at least in parts of europe you know how with ground beef the more you handle it, it the texture changes mm -hmm. and i think that what it what happens is that there are places in europe where in the uk where they just handle it more. So it ends up, the texture is very different. It's tender. No, it's not that it's more tender. It's just different, which affects the flavor. Oh, interesting. Um, you know, I don't want to say if it's, it's better or worse, because that's a subjective thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the best burgers I've had in my entire life was in the UK, in London. Interesting. There was a bar in, a bar in, Chelsea in London called the pharmacy. The, the burger was amazing. Well, that London's was, on my list too. I've heard London is a great place. It's a lot. Of, it reminds me of New York a lot, actually. That's what I've heard. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Uh, Salman Rushdie, uh, famous, famous writer. He, uh, this was for a magazine. This was the Alpha 7R2 2470 GM. Uh, I have an octobank on the left and a strobe behind him with a blue gel on a back, black background. You can see in the reverse chronological order, we started with the Alpha 9.3, Alpha 1, Alpha 7 R5. Now we're getting into the Alpha 7 R2, which is when I um, 
the Alpha 7 R2 is when I switched to mirrorless full time when that camera came out. Um, so I photographed Salman Rushdie for a magazine called Poets and Writers. Uh, this was the cover. Um, this was a situation where, as is often the case when you're shooting editorial, there's competing interests. So there was an interview with him first and we were set up and waiting and the interview went long and often as it does, cause you're talking to somebody really cool. Why are, it, I'm sure it's hard to be like, Oh, you know, we, we should wrap it up. Um, so in those situations, what often happens is, you know, maybe there was an hour and a half for the interview and it half an hour for you to photograph, but now you've got 10 minutes and you've just got to make it work. So I'm, I'm, we did the, this one first. I'm rushing it. And then he was such a nice guy. He's like, oh, it's fine. Oh, wow. He was in no rush. He gave us all the time we needed. He was so nice. Um, we were photographing him in his agent's office in Manhattan. Uh, yeah, and he couldn't have been nicer. And then just, you know, he's he's someone that had such an impact on the world. And, you know, there was the fat one that in the 90s and everything. Um, so it was just so interesting to photograph him. And he could not have been nicer. It's always a pleasant surprise when you get that right. When you have somebody who's willing to let you do your thing and not rush you. And yeah, and I mean, and I don't want to fault the people who are, you know, I don't know what they've got going on. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've, you know, maybe they've got to go pick up their kids from school or who knows. You know, you can't blame someone for say, telling you ahead of time, I have to leave at five and then leaving at five. That's, but when, you're told someone has to leave at five and they're like, you know what? It's cool. We've got time. Mm -hmm. It's, it's fantastic. So for all our viewers out there, Tony, what's the secret to photographing someone with glasses when using, especially a larger light source that's harder to hide. So there there's two options. Um, one you can see, so his, his chin is down a little. So you've got the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So because his head is down a little bit, the angle that the light is reflecting off of the glasses is mostly not towards the camera. Um, but you can see there's a little, if you look on our left, there's a, you can see a little reflection. A little in bit. Um, but a little doesn't really bother me. Um, yeah. The other option, and I do this a lot, especially in corporate shoots where I've got less flexibility. Like, you know, if I'm shooting 25 people today, I can't change the light. The light is where it is. So whereas in a situation like this, I could have moved the light if I needed to because I'm just photographing him. Um, I will photograph someone after we're done. I will just have them take the glasses off, hold them in their hands and be like, look here, look here, look here, look here. You know, try and get a whole range of head positions. And then you just use that for retouching. Interesting. So it's, you know, if, if there's a lot of glare, but you've got it. Uh, image without the glasses where the head is in a at the same angle you can just take the eye and put it in and keep the glasses frames it's it sounds i think it sounds harder than it is it's if you did it right it's not that hard to fix hmm. sounds about i mean sounds like it works you just got to get the right angle it's the same i guess as the composite just working yeah. the same angle and yeah now, if you don't have the right angle, then it's a thing. Then, it, then it's a little bit of a of, of a project. Yeah, maybe, maybe with AI now though, AI is making it easier and easier. Maybe, but you know, AI though, is it gonna? It sure it will give you an eye without reflection that looks good, but will it be their eye? It won't be their eye. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and it's I want it to be their eye, like they're gonna know it's not their eye. Yeah. Um. This is Matt Cervetto. He's an actor. He played an FBI agent on The Sopranos uh, for several episodes, for example. This was also for a magazine, uh, Alpha 7 R2, uh, 2470 GM. One fifteenth of a second to, so that the ambient lights in the background bleed in. And I've got a big soft box on the other side of the bar on the left. Um, this was also, you know, it's just a fun location. This was a, I think it's Murray's Cheese Shop on 19th or 18th in Broadway. They've got a bar in the basement. Um, and we had the run of the place for the shoot. You get to shoot in some random places when you're shooting editorial. They're like, oh, 
we've got you this place. I'm like, great. If I'd called them, they never would have let me shoot there. Um, <laughs> and he was also great. He was, uh, we shot outside, we shot upstairs, we shot all over. He, he was, he was game for anything. Um, and this too, that's uh, some iced tea that's in the glass. It's not actual whatever liquor that might look like. But it's the same thing. Like somebody sitting at a bar without a glass is just, it looks like you were setting it up for a shoot. Whereas this feels like a moment to me. Yeah, definitely. You know, in his expression. It, and it's, It sells the moment. Yeah. I, I've always really liked this picture. This is one of my favorite pictures. Yeah, I was going to say, this is one of my favorite images. Of yours. There's just something about the mood, the expression. I, th I think the ambient lights in the back adds so much. It's like that that cinema approach to the lighting where you just have the little small light sources scattered, creates that nice glow in the background. Yeah, I think I think it helps sell it. If it was just black, it would be like, why? Yeah. Um, this is in Hawaii. You probably could have guessed that. Uh, I put this in in part because this is right when I first switched to Sony. Uh, I was borrowing an Alpha 900, which is was a DSLR, with their 2470 Sony Zeiss. Um, my first trip to Hawaii, at the time, I was fitter and I was doing triathlons. So I had reached out uh, to a triathlete I found because I thought it would be cool to photograph somebody. Uh, so we went, this is on, so if this east, the east side of Oahu, I think. If someone lives in Hawaii, feel free to correct me. Um, you know, parts of Hawaii don't look like how Hawaii looks in your head. Um, but this did. Uh, and so I had him going up and down that road. You know, I was perched there on a rock. And it's just, it it feels so much like a, like what I had in my head. You know, somebody's cycling on this lonely, there are a couple cars back there, but this lonely road in Hawaii, you've got the waves crashing, you've got the cliffs, you've got everything in them. So I was testing the camera at the time. And after that trip to Hawaii, I'm like, all right. That's what sold you on it? I, I was really happy with a bunch of the shots I got. Like, all right. I was unhappy with what I was shooting and I was going to switch to something. So <laughs> it worked. It filled in the void. Well, and it was, I was really, yeah, the, the image quality was great. The A900, the Alpha 900 was Sony's first professional DSLR after they bought Minolta. Uh, and it was a great camera. When you look at where we are now, I mean, nobody can argue with your decision. No, no. Seeing, they, a, seeing, seeing the trajectory that Sony's taken. They've done okay. They've done all right. They've done all right. Look, that wasn't too bad, right? Are you asking me or the audience? I'm asking you. Was that was that better than you know? I feel like when you have to you know wear the the educator hat, it's a little more difficult, a little more preparation. It's nice. To it, get it was on a lot. It was much less work, which is yes. It's always a welcome welcome escape from the educational spectrum, and it's nice it to nice. just be able to reflect on some images, even if we went in reverse. Well, but, you know. Who's to say what order is the correct order? There you go. We take things always uh, always with the positive off spin on it. But Tony, I want to thank you not only for today. It was great to to really just reflect on some of your past images with you. But for all you do here on the event space, we can't thank you enough on behalf of our team, our audience. You provide some of our best education round the clock, round the calendar. Um for any of you guys who are unfamiliar with Tony, definitely check out his work. If you pay attention to the event space, you've definitely seen him here more than a time or two. But a uh, huge thank you to you, Tony. I'm sure we will see you very, very, very shortly. I don't know what uh, the two next weeks. is. Two weeks. Uh, there we go. We're, our, we're starting our lighting series. There we go. See, I knew you would be on it. I'm still in Vegas mode. I'm like, I'm still getting back from from the yeah. WPPI circuit and getting my time adjusted. So... WPPI is a long event. It's yeah, it's a good yeah. one. I, I, it's a good good crowd out there. Shout out to Monica Sigmund for all the hospitality out there and the Monica's the entire great. Sony team. Eldine, 
got to got to see Aldine, Kayla, you know, some some great people on the team there that always always make it a wonderful event to attend and uh Absolutely. just a great community in general. I agree. Great there. It's a great bunch of people over there. Definitely. Well, Tony, huge thank you to you once again for joining us and to all of our viewers out there. Thank you as always. That is it. Another edition of BNH Virtual Event Space now in the books. Catch you all next time. Thanks, everybody.